If you're from Chicago, there's a good chance you remember a story in the news from 20 years back about a man who called himself Dr. Chaos. Dr. Chaos was famously caught housing a bunch of stolen cyanide in a secret room in the blue line of Chicago's subway system. Bear in mind this was only a few months after 9-11 and the 2001 anthrax attacks, giving residents much cause to be alarmed. News outlets labeled Dr. Chaos as an anarchist and likened him to a real-life supervillain. But as this anomaly will explain, the truth about our subject is far more complicated. So if we're going to unravel all this, we need to start at the very beginning. Dr. Chaos was born Joseph Daniel Konopka on June 24, 1976, near Green Bay, Wisconsin. Joe, as his family called him, never knew his father. And although his mother did her best, it was his grandparents who essentially raised him until the age of six. He enjoyed an especially close relationship with his grandfather and Uncle Dan, although he was unusually withdrawn for a boy his age. His grandparents encouraged his keen interest in electronics from the get-go, with the Chicago Tribune writing that school officials pointed teachers in his direction whenever they had computer problems. Though he was a prodigious student, Joe's mother recounted he quickly grew bored of school and had issues socializing with kids his age. So, by the time he hit high school, he decided to drop out. Luckily for Joe, his grandmother Marion had been a school teacher and agreed to tutor him so he wouldn't fall behind. Joe remained socially withdrawn up to this point, with Grandma Marion describing him as, quote, an intelligent loner who rarely shared his feelings with his family. He was usually around home evenings there monkeying with his, playing with his computer. His grandpa, Ben, helped fuel an interest in urban exploration by taking the lad on road trips throughout Wisconsin. It should come as no surprise, then, that Joe took his grandfather's death around 1988 especially hard. Yet even with his family, he maintained his stoic composure with his uncle Dan recounting, quote, I'm sure he was very upset when my father passed, but he never let it out. He kept it all to himself. He didn't cry. And so, facing the loss of his biggest influence in life, Joe withdrew further and further into his computers. At the age of 14, Joe's love for urban exploration drove him to sneak out of the house at night to go check out Green Bay's abandoned buildings, electrical systems, and sewer tunnels, usually on foot. By 1992, Joe caught on with an emerging technology that would facilitate forming social connections for the first time in his life, the internet. He forged early friendships on the web by posting to several internet bulletin board services, where he'd trade tips on urban exploration with other like-minded youth. Most of Joe's free time was now spent riding around in the countryside of Wisconsin with people he'd met online. Still, meeting people outside of the internet continued to prove difficult for the adolescent. His uncle Dan said that he only ever talked about electronics and music, remembering, quote, He didn't seem to have an interest in girls. He was so tied up in these computers, I think that was all that mattered to him. Joe's lack of social cohesion outside of family and internet friends seems to have colored his attitudes towards society. Court documents speculated that he matured slower than the average male in the early 90s, and indeed he began finding joy in what were considered, quote, pointless and destructive activities. It shouldn't come as a surprise that Joe's first brush with the law happened in 1994, when he was apparently arrested on charges of, quote, felony negligent handling of burning materials and burglary. Next, he was arrested in 1996 for joyriding through a Wisconsin suburb, where he smashed up mailboxes and street lamps and crashed his vehicle into a handful of garages. He also tried breaking into cars. Alluding to his motives, Joe supposedly told an accomplice, quote, If he can't have the items, then why should other people have them? And so to prevent that, Kanopka drove him to different locations and instructed him how to do damage to these locations. For this, Joe spent 10 months behind bars and was given three years probation. His time in the slammer gave him a chance to catch up on his formal studies. And at some point while incarcerated, Joe was finally able to get his high school diploma. Neither incident hurt Joe's job prospects, though. At the age of 20, and despite his criminal record, he found work as a technician for a Green Bay internet service provider called Infinity Technology, eventually becoming their systems administrator. His boss, Dennis Challey, found him to be a punctual and highly gifted worker. Though a stable career should have set Joe on the straight and narrow, the mayhem he caused in his teen years was irresistibly calling to him once more. Only now, Joe was thinking bigger. He wanted to pull off more elaborate crimes using his technical skill set. To do this, however, Joe would need some extra hands on board. He found exactly that on the internet. At some point in the mid-90s, Joe created an IRC chatroom called Teens for Satan, 
and started recruiting teenage boys into what he called the Realm of Chaos. Now using the online name Dr. Chaos, Joe had no trouble building a following of bored adolescents that he'd mentor in the ways of programming and vandalism. Computer hacking was quickly becoming one of his favorite pastimes, but before long, Dr. Chaos found himself in over his head in a way that could threaten his career. Dr. Chaos first met Chad Raymer at some point in the mid-90s when he made a house call to upgrade the Raymer family computer. He befriended the teenage Chad and invited him to chat further on his IRC server, eventually bringing him into the realm of chaos. Chad and his girlfriend Lindsay began tagging along on Dr. Chaos's missions to vandalize public utilities throughout Wisconsin. Court documents confirm they helped Dr. Chaos sabotage the electricity in Algoma, Wisconsin, with the three watching the blackout from a hill overlooking the small town. Chad continued to assist Dr. Chaos in all matters of wreaking havoc throughout 1997, while also helping recruit new members into the realm of chaos. Dr. Chaos was known to invite his minions to his workplace after hours, hosting LAN parties and helping them to pirate EA video games on request. At the same time, Dr. Chaos had become so invaluable to the company that he was given control over their entire computer system. Unfortunately, trouble was brewing at Infinity Technologies. An employee named Samuel Graham left his job there in 1998 to start a rival internet service provider named Funworld LLC, which at first catered to online gamers. Apparently, one of the co-owners of Infinity told him he'd be sorry for doing such a thing. Samuel, nevertheless, used Infinity's services to design his website and host a couple of gaming servers, a job Dr. Chaos was put in charge of. Of course, when Dr. Chaos found out about the bad blood between companies, his first instinct was to plot ways he could get revenge on Funworld. According to court documents, Funworld alleged that Dr. Chaos launched a three-pronged attack on their services that included hacking, spoofing, and flooding their servers to cause a denial of service. Samuel Graham contacted Infinity multiple times throughout 1998 and 1999 to complain about these attacks, claiming he'd backtrace them to their ISP. Dr. Chaos himself replied to the emails, arguing the attack could be coming from any of their 5,000 customers. By now, the hacker had looped some of his peons from the Realm of Chaos into his brigade, including Chad Raymer, who apparently left several nasty messages on the Fun World forums. Perhaps most boldly, Samuel alleged that he caught Dr. Chaos working on code to redirect Funworld customers to pornographic websites while the two were at a business convention. Though he denied all accusations, Dr. Chaos couldn't help but brag to his fellow employees about all the ways he was screwing with Funworld. The sabotaging of Funworld didn't eat up all of Dr. Chaos's time though, and he continued with his attacks on public utilities and more throughout 1998 and beyond. He continued to recruit new disciples to his realm through work, the internet, or mutual acquaintances. Like most of his followers, these youngsters hid behind usernames like Acid Drop, Citizen Zero, and Defcon. With their help, Dr. Chaos committed enough crimes to rack up over 50 charges in the period between 1998 and 2001. He attacked multiple electrical substations throughout 1998, usually by throwing barbed wire on their distribution arrays. In Shawano County, Dr. Chaos was accused of tampering with the valves at a natural gas plant, then trying to ignite the gas using other chemicals. Though he was initially successful, the sheer force of the venting gas actually blew out the flame. Dr. Chaos was also known for breaking into radio stations and playing satanic music over the airwaves, or simply damaging their transmitters. Other charges included destroying a warning siren outside a nuclear power plant and setting a sauerkraut factory on fire. Needless to say, it was a busy couple of years for Dr. Chaos and his realm of chaos. Damages from their hijinks totaled over $800,000. But it wasn't long before law enforcement was able to catch up with him, thanks to a tip given by a friend of one of Dr. Chaos's underlings. Several charges were laid against Dr. Chaos in the wake of his arrest, including conspiracy, arson, creating counterfeit software, and interference with computers. His mother and Aunt Audrey helped him come up with the $15,000 needed for bail. Dr. Chaos awaited his court date at the family farm back in De Pere, terrified of spending years behind bars. Ill-prepared to face the consequences of his crimes, he took out his last $13,000 and hit the road in June 2001, against all pleas of his grandmother and Uncle Dan. Although they contacted authorities, they were too slow for Dr. Chaos, who successfully made his escape. No one knew where he was going, or how he'd wind up. 
it turns out that Dr. Chaos landed in Chicago. Here, he once again met people with similar interests on a local message board. Around this time, he went by either Jeremy or Derailer, dazzling his fellow explorers with his skills at picking locks and getting into restricted spaces. Dr. Chaos took over a storage room hidden in the Chicago Transit Authority's subway system, changing the locks and setting up shop with his computers and other hardware. He remained unemployed, but kept himself busy spelunking abandoned buildings throughout the Chicago metropolitan area. Dr. Chaos retained his circle of lackeys, using his storage closet as a de facto lair for the Realm of Chaos. During late summer 2001, he and an associate discovered an old warehouse on Chicago's south side, and remarkably, it had its doors unlocked. The two explorers took full advantage, eventually finding a room chock full of containers housing sodium cyanide and potassium cyanide. They promptly made off with the chemicals without really having a plan for what to do with them at the time. For now, Dr. Chaos would store them at a secret hideaway. He later told his lawyer he considered the chemicals a quote, unique, cool thing to have. Oblivious to the severity of possessing such compounds, Dr. Chaos continued nosing around Chicago for several months. During this time, he was known to keep a vial of sodium cyanide sodium carbonate on his person. It's unknown why he had it, but Dr. Chaos's family later speculated it was a means of poisoning himself if the feds ever caught up with him. And they would just a few months later, when Dr. Chaos and two teenage underlings were spotted lurking around the University of Illinois Chicago. Apparently the school had been the target of a string of burglaries around that time and thus ramped up security as a precaution. In March of 2002, campus police caught Dr. Chaos and one of his cronies prowling around the steam tunnels at 2.15 in the morning, nabbing the two for trespassing. His other henchmen managed to escape. Campus police quickly found the vial of chemicals Dr. Chaos was carrying, and realized they may have stumbled onto something much bigger. Running a background check on Joseph Daniel Konopka, they discovered the warrants issued by the FBI and quickly contacted officials. A full sweep of the Blue Line and Red Line under Chicago was initiated, shutting down the subway and portions of Dearborn Street well into Saturday. Here, they discovered his secret hideout and the pound of sodium cyanide and quarter pound of potassium cyanide Dr. Chaos was holding on to. Authorities found that Dr. Chaos had been hoarding burglary tools, sketches of the transit line, a GPS device, and a radio scanner, along with the keys to numerous Chicago Transit Authority substations. The feds also found out about Dr. Chaos's many photos of the Chicago subways, which caused them great concern even though these were probably just taken to show off to his internet friends. The urban explorer was charged with possessing a chemical weapon. Dr. Chaos waived his right to bail, which would have been denied anyway after a federal magistrate judge deemed him in extreme danger. Chicago Police Superintendent Terry Hillard didn't find Dr. Chaos as menacing, though. I really do truly doubt that he presented a danger to, to our citizens and, and, and to the subway system. The subway is safe. He later concluded, quote, he's a geek. Our public transportation unit has walked every inch of the rapid transit lines in the subway and have not found anything that was unusual other than what the FBI confiscated the other night. District Attorney Tim Funnel also didn't find Dr. Chaos overly nefarious, saying of his motives, quote, He's sort of disillusioned with society in general, disillusioned with the way society works, disillusioned with the way the government works. This is the way he chose to protest. Dr. Chaos's grandma resisted the media's attempts to label him as the next Ted Kaczynski, affirming he was no menace but that, quote, I don't know what kind of dark clouds have been going through his mind. It was her belief that his anarchist acts were but an attempt to impress his internet friends and teenage followers. Quote, maybe he thought it would have been awesome for some of these kids and leave their mouths hanging open. Dr. Chaos partially admitted to this himself, telling police he committed the crimes to, quote, take personal entertainment out of observing the consequences of property damage. I took personal satisfaction in causing this property damage because of a sense of intellectual superiority which I felt. Along with the chemical weapons charge, Dr. Chaos finally had to face justice for all the crimes he committed in Wisconsin. He was summoned to Milwaukee in June 2002, with his trial scheduled that September. Court documents from the trials provided an extensive character study into the mind of Dr. Chaos and offered wildly different perspectives into his character. Chad Raymer's parents stated that the friendship he had with their son had over time become abusive. Dr. Chaos was even said to have once used a stun gun on Chad to keep him in line. Another former associate told officials he was, quote, fascinated with lasers and pyrotechnics and said that Dr. Chaos had built homemade weapons including a sonic boom gun and a microwave gun. 
On the other hand, the defense highlighted the kinder side of Joseph Konopka and insisted he was not a danger to people. It was revealed that Dr. Chaos had donated much of his time to the American Red Cross, designing them helpful computer programs without any expectation of pay. A former follower of Dr. Chaos also said that he had helped the young man kick an alcohol and drug addiction by teaching him about coding, and even offered to pay his way through college. Though he later offered to repay Dr. Chaos, the computer hacker told him to forget about it and focus on his studies. Accordingly, the defense asked the bench to consider that Joseph Konopka still had the capacity to turn his life around and use his destructive skills for good. Dr. Chaos initially pled not guilty to 13 federal charges, which carried a penalty of up to 30 years behind bars. By late September, he had changed lawyers, and with that changed his legal strategy. His new counsel instead hashed out a plea agreement with the bench ahead of the trial in October. And so, Dr. Chaos pled guilty to the six federal felonies he had previously tried running from, along with the two new ones he had racked up in Illinois. Six juveniles from the realm of chaos, located all throughout Wisconsin, were also charged with aiding Dr. Chaos. The criminal mastermind was expected to face up to 20 years in prison for his shenanigans. Part of the plea deal meant that his sentencing in Wisconsin would also take into account his pending legal troubles in Illinois, with prosecutors promising not to follow up with additional charges beyond what was already on the table. He was also expected to pay back $436,000 in restitution. Sentencing for the chemical weapons charge took place in March 2003. Dr. Chaos apologized for causing the disruption to Chicago commuters the previous year. When presiding judge Wayne Anderson asked him why he kept the chemicals, Dr. Chaos answered, quote, I have several reasons, but no good reasons. His lawyer insisted that he had never thought of the cyanide's use as a weapon, adding that Dr. Chaos sometimes showed his teenage followers the cyanide just because he thought it was neat. Judge Anderson took note of Dr. Chaos's superior intellect, but ordered him to undergo psychiatric evaluation and entry into a treatment program for chemical dependency. As such, Dr. Chaos was given 13 years for storing dangerous chemicals in the Chicago subway system. By April, Dr. Chaos tried withdrawing his guilty plea. This was after he learned that the explosives charge carried a mandatory 10-year prison sentence that only began after serving time on the other charges, bumping up his total to over 23 years. Though the judge initially denied his withdrawal, this was taken to appeals court. A three-judge panel overturned the ruling in 2005, agreeing that Dr. Chaos should have been allowed to get out of his plea deal accordingly. Dr. Chaos was thus retried and given only seven years, bringing his total to 20 years in prison. Life behind bars began in Colorado at ADX Florence. In 2009, Dr. Chaos was accused of trying to quote, construct devices intended to interfere with video and communication equipment and disable fence alarms. The next year, he was, quote, discovered to have various electronic devices, circuits, and wires in his cell. Dr. Chaos argued that these devices were permitted by prison officials, and that claims he was plotting an escape were entirely without merit. No other issues involving Dr. Chaos were reported during the rest of his time spent incarcerated. Sadly, Marion Konopka passed away in 2012, a few years before her grandson got out of prison. He was ultimately released in July 2019, and opened up about his prison sentence in an interview with WGN News Chicago. No ill intent, I didn't have any plan to do any terrible thing with the cyanide. It was one of those kind of spur of the moment things that you sometimes get to do when you're young. <laughs> Here, he offered a most unconventional opinion of living in a supermax. I have my issues with the affairs of the U.S. government and the Justice Department, but not as a direct consequence of Supermax. I, I actually rather enjoyed my time there, and if I was going to go back to prison, I might consider trying to get back there. It's not as bad as people make it out to be. People might not be comforted, Joe, to know that you wouldn't mind going back in. I would prefer not to return to prison, but... If I was returning to prison for, you know, whatever reason, because I have a personality conflict with my probation officer or whatever, um, I mean, Supermax wouldn't be a bad place to do it. <laughs> no longer going by Dr. Chaos, Joseph also spoke about what he planned on doing with his life now that he was free. I've been uh, enjoying the CTA from above rather than from below. Um, you know, just basically working and staying out of trouble. If at some point in the future, when I'm done with my supervision, if I feel like getting back into, say, hacking, there are opportunities now to do that ethically, where you can you can contract with companies and 
you know, work with them to secure their networks rather than just working against everybody to screw up the world. Some of his comments to the news outlet were apparently cause for alarm to the feds, who had been keeping a close eye on him as part of his supervised release. He was thus subjected to a search of his home in person by his probation officer in 2020. Though officials moved to limit the contact he had with the media, this was denied by the judge overseeing the court hearing. True to what he said in the interview, Joseph Konopka has maintained a low profile since his release. He insists that the mischief he caused in his early 20s was driven mostly by boredom, rather than any sort of anarchist ideology. As for his interference with Fun World LLC back in the 90s, the issue reached courts around June 2003 when Samuel Graham attempted to sue Infinity Technologies for colluding with Dr. Chaos. Infinity was found not liable, and although this was successfully appealed, it is unclear what became of the case. That ordeal was obviously small potatoes compared to the much bigger charges Joseph faced, and as such received comparatively little attention in the media. Overall, Joseph's story remains a fascinating glimpse into how the early internet changed how people connected, especially those young eccentrics who were able to coordinate widespread mayhem mostly unimpeded. Now, with Joseph's desire to instead pursue white hat hacking rather than returning to his life of crime, the tale of Dr. Chaos appears to have reached its definitive ending.